You may already know that our pastor's on vacation, comes back today. And so uh, thankful that he and his family have been able to, to get away for this time of rest. And we're, we're glad to have Josh Brooks with us this morning to preach God's Word. And I have an intro from Pastor Matt, so I'll read it as if I'm him. It's kind of unusual, but uh, he, he likes you that much. I, I, I would take it as that. Josh is a good friend of mine and has pastored in Greenwood and Florida. He is one of the owners of Brooks Electric in town, and he is currently working toward a church plant in Greenwood. Josh and his oldest daughter, Gracie, host the Theodox podcast, which I have been able to join them on several times. Again, just reading as Pastor Matt. I have come to appreciate Josh's passion for exalting Christ in all things and his wise counsel as a friend. Appreciate you being here, your wife and one of your daughters, and come on up and preach God's word for us this morning, if you will. Well, I have to say uh, thanks to Matt. That's quite humbling. Um, I would firmly agree we've become good friends. And um, as the best way to become friends around uh, Christ and God's Word. And um, so it's been great to get to know him. Uh, yeah, my name is Joshua Brooks. I'm lifelong, well, born and raised here in Greenwood, moved out for a little bit and came back. So all of our families here, we're familiar with the town and the culture and everything here in Greenwood. Um, I'm honored that Matt would trust me to come before your your flock here and speak this morning. I did uh, let him know that we're just going to preach on a couple of uh, really hot topic issues and stir up a bunch of mess, so he's got some work to do when he comes back. So may as well do that while I'm just here and going right out the door. Um, no, serious. Uh, uh, to me, the body of Christ um, is a precious thing, and so it's really um, it's an honor when someone will trust you to come in and speak. Uh, to the body that that uh, he is uh, caring for for you all here. So um, today we're going to do something a little bit ambitious. Um, we're going to go through the whole chapter of John 17, and um, the reason being, uh, Matt and I talked a little bit, and he expressed that you all have kind of gone through some things that maybe are are a little heavy and have some things coming up. And he said, "Hey, it would be great for our body just to be encouraged," and. For me, um, nothing is more encouraging than hearing about what God is doing and what Christ is doing for us. And so to me, John 17 is a great chapter uh, for us to see that. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to go through it. So you can go ahead and turn there. I hear many of you doing that already. Um, it's, a, it's a great picture of Jesus' work for us. So before we get into that, I kind of want us to, to set this up a little bit and go back to Job. You're familiar with the story of Job. Um, Job has everything taken from him. Um, his gets to the point where he is, his health is being taken. He's, he's uh, bedridden, he's stricken, and he has friends that come and give counsel to him. Um, and they bring into question his character. And in chapter uh, 9, Job responds to his friends, and he reaches this understanding in verse 32 and 33 that God is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There's no arbiter between us who might lay his hands on both of us. What Job identifies is that there's this unbridgeable chasm between us humans and God. It's not a, it's not a chasm of, of a matter of distance. It's not as if God is so far away that we need a messenger. God is transcendent and altogether distant and different from us. But it's not just a matter of distance. It's a matter of holiness. The unbridgeable chasm is a chasm of holiness between us and God. And Job identifies, like, there's no one to bridge this gap. So we know that Jesus resolved this issue. Spoiler alert. He is the one who bridged this gap, and that's what we're going to talk about today in John 17. All of Jesus' work can be summarized under the heading of mediation. This is his complete work in coming to earth, is to mediate between his atonement, all the things that we can list out, the details of Jesus' work, did exactly that. And this is very vivid in this chapter uh, with his intercession for his people. So, we, uh, I'm sorry, I've already turned there. 
normally I I do like little bits of scripture. So this whole chapter is going to be a, a challenge. And um, yeah, I'll also give another disclaimer. Um, earlier in the week, I was stricken with vertigo. And um, thankfully, I was about 80% finished with my prep on the study side of this. But the delivery side became another issue. <laughs> so I'm probably going to be a little more tied to my notes than usual. So if it's garbage, uh, I pray that God will use um, the truth of his word, regardless of the messenger. So, um, yes, in John 17. So this is a vivid expression of Jesus interceding for his people. So let's read. I want to read just the first five verses to begin with and highlight a few things. <clears throat> so John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And two things to kind of set up what's happening in John 17. So in John 13, Jesus starts to, to uh, teach his disciples. He washes their feet, and there's a whole encounter from John 13 all the way through 16. So in John 17, look at this transition. He goes from speaking to them, and he lifts his eyes to heaven. So this is Jesus uh, changing the direction of what he's, who he's speaking to. Okay? He's directly praying to God, and we see that shift in verse 1 there. But what I want to highlight for, for us today is verse 5. Going back to verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. <clears throat> so Jesus, by saying this, is showing us that he existed prior to the world. Jesus resided with God, the Father. He is the second person of our Trinitarian God and existed eternally. What you see throughout these verses, 1 through 5, is this interwoven glory given, Jesus giving glory to God, God glorifying the Son, this interwoven authority between the two. And the, the reality of Jesus' existence, His eternal existence, is of paramount importance to us when we under, to understand His work for us. Because all, all of us humans are born like Job. We're in the same nature. Job knew that no mere human, not himself or anyone else, could bridge this gap. And so what we see with Jesus' words here in verse 5 is that it wasn't just a mere human. It was God himself who was bridging the gap. <clears throat> so Jesus, truly God and truly man, is able to be the arbiter between and lay hands on both of us. Let's go on in verses 6 through 19. And what we're going to do through the rest of this chapter is we're going to read big portions of it, and then we're going to go through and pretty much outline the chapter. And so by outlining it, we're going to see specific points um, or themes that will help us understand Jesus' work for us. So starting in verse 6, we'll go on to 6 to 19. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours." All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, 
because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified. It's a lot there. Surely this one chapter, you could preach a series, probably a good month long sermons. Um, so in, in this chapter, in that portion that we read and even the, the verses to come, uh, Jesus intermingles statements about the Father's work, about His own work, he, uh, things that He's praying for, and statements about His people. So that's going to be our outline, those four headings. And so we're going to walk through just looking at what is He saying in, with these specific um, groups or themes. So let's start with the first one. What is He saying about the Father's work? I'm going to reference a number of these scriptures and just walk through. So number one, in verse six, the Father gave the people to Christ. I want to give you time if you want to look at these, because I know I have them written down. You might be like, I don't check this guy out. Be Bereans, please. Um, all right, so in verse six, he gave the Father gave the people to Christ. In verse eight, he gave the words to Christ. In verse 11, he gave Christ his name. Jesus says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me. In verse 18, the Father sent Christ into the world. In verse 22, uh, the Father gives Christ glory. You know what? In my notes, I jumped on down to the section we haven't read yet, but we'll do it anyway. In verse 24, the Father loved Christ before the foundation of the world. So he, he reinforces uh, the, the reality of the pre-existence of Christ, the eternal existence of Christ. So in, in this chapter, what do we see of God's work? It's centered on Christ. Everything we just said here, so we see the Father's work. Uh, he gave the people to Christ. He gave words to Christ. He gave Christ His name. He gave Christ to the world. He gives Christ glory. He loved Christ before the foundation of the world. So all of the Father's work we see is, is channeled to Christ. So let's go on to the next theme, Christ's work. Um, in verse 6, Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. So Christ's work, Christ gives the name of the Father to us. Verse 8, Christ says, I have given them the words you gave me. So he manifests God's name. He comes to us. How many times has Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I don't do anything in my own name. We'll get to more of that later. But that's what he's getting at there. Verse 12. Jesus says, I have kept them in your name. I have guarded them. Verse 13. Jesus says, I am coming to you, Father. Verse 14. I have given them your word. Some of these are kind of like very closely related or just repetitious. Verse 19, Jesus says, I have consecrated myself. So what I want us to see here is this really cool picture. Like you, in outlining this, you really start to see God's work and Jesus' work and how Jesus' work connects God to humanity. Because we see this going right, flowing right through here. God's works funneling and channeled towards Christ. Christ's work is connected to bringing what the Father said to him to the people. I don't know if that's a good visual. Just coming here and there and there and there. So anyway. Um, so we see Jesus connecting humanity to the divine. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me. I have given them the words you gave me. I kept them in your name. Everything Christ is doing is for the reconciliation of humans for God's glory. All of that's connected. So the Father's work, Jesus' work, and let's look at what Jesus prays for. So in verse 9, Jesus identifies who he's praying for. 
And then he makes three petitions. It's interesting, this whole chapter is considered the high priestly prayer. There, I mean, we might can go through here and, and pull out some other kind of implied prayers, but there are three that are like obvious petitions. And then a lot of other statements. So let's look at the three prayers that Jesus prays. Verse 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name that they may be one. It's a direct petition. Verse 15, he says, I ask that you keep them from the evil one. In verse 17, he says, sanctify them in your word of truth. Here's what's really interesting in this chapter. The things that Jesus is praying for are also things that he said he's already done. Like, that's what's really wild when you sit back and look at this. For example, in verse 11, he prays, Father, keep them in your name. And in verse 12, he says, I kept them in your name. Verse 12, he says, I have guarded them. And in verse 15, he prays that the Father would keep them from the evil one. Verse 17, he prays, sanctify them in the truth. And in verse 19, he says, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified. So the first thing I want us to see from this is that Jesus is working out the very things that he's praying for. He's not merely a helpless human. He's not like Job or like us, begging and pleading the divine to do things. So let's look at the last point of our theme, his people. What does it say about his people? Verse 6 says his people belong to Christ. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. Verse 6, he says, they have kept the Father's word. That's what he says about his people. Now, so far in our, in our uh, chapter, he is praying for those who are in his immediate historical context. Those that were gathered that he had been teaching, he's praying for them. And we're going to see how he shifts here in a minute. So I want us to understand, as he's praying these things, he's praying or saying these things about these people, it's for, about those who are in his immediate context. Um, verse 7, they know that everything Christ possesses was given by the Father. Verse 8, they have received the words of truth that Christ came from the Father. Now, receive doesn't mean just hear. Because there are a whole lot of people that heard Christ's words, right? So receive has to mean more than just like, oh, we heard what he said. Receive has to do with, we received it in our hearts. Like it's something that, that, that affected us, impacted us. So they've received his words. Droves of people heard him, but they didn't receive. Verse 11, this is what it says about his people. They are in the world. It's an obvious one. Verse 12, they are kept and guarded by Christ. And verse 14, the world has hated them. Jesus states these things about his people in a very absolute way. And this is what strikes me as really interesting and weird. He, he isn't saying, I hope, God, please, I hope they, they are guarded and they're kept. He, he isn't saying that... Um, you know, man, I, I, I hope they trust in your name. He states it in a very absolute way. And in a way that we know is not truly perfected. Like, let's think about the disciples, because that's still who he's talking about at this point. When he says statements like, they have kept the Father's word. And I think we can rightfully wonder, even reading scripture, and go like, have they? You know, have they? I mean, in verse 7, Jesus testifies to the, their unwavering faith in Christ. But is that what we've seen of the disciples? No. Jesus is declaring ultimate realities of his children, even though we don't see them absolutely yet. That's what's happening. And it's wild. 
In short, Jesus is making statements of absolute certainty that only he can make because he's connected to the Father. Because he's also connected to humans. Because he's fulfilling the Father's purpose. Because he knows the end from the beginning. And he's praying toward that end. No, Jesus' prayers are not mere wishes and hopes. He isn't pleading as if there's doubt. His prayers are consistent with his obedience to the Father's will. His prayers are also in harmony with the working of the Trinity. So he's not praying for something outside of the Father's decrees and outside of the working of the Spirit. Sorry. Yeah, these are these are two things that I think sometimes get to be problematic. And so I want to address this. Uh, we can't make the mistake of reducing Jesus to a mere human that offered requests to God as if God wouldn't meet them. Some draw this conclusion when they think about the, the Jesus' prayer in the garden. I think it can kind of be a little bit questioning for us or problematic or troubling to think, man, did Jesus have a prayer that he asked God for something and, and the answer is no? And, and, and in reality, if, if Jesus has unanswered prayers, then what does that mean for us? Like this is, this is a huge deal. So there are some that conclude that Jesus has prayers that go unanswered or answered no. And I'd say they're not consistent with the harmony of the Trinity, nor with Scripture. So, some examples. Throughout the Gospels, we hear Jesus say things like, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only say what the Father says. I do nothing of my own accord, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. If Jesus truly sought to do the Father's will, then that includes His prayers. He wouldn't truly be about the Father's will if He were petitioning the Father to do something that was contrary to His will. So whatever questions we have about Jesus' prayer in the garden, when in Matthew's account it reads like this, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And whatever questions we have of this prayer, ultimately we need to see that Jesus prays for the Father's will to be done. Yes, in His humanity, He's truly God, He's truly man. He's not empty of either of those. And in His humanity, He's wrestling with what's going to take place, but in His divinity, He's submitting to the Father's will. Jesus' prayer wasn't unanswered. He wasn't told no. Because he was praying for the Father's will to be accomplished. And as for the Trinity, we don't have time to adequately cover the unity or the harmony of the Trinity. <laughs> I think ambitious enough to say we're going to cover all of John 17. Um, but I do want to leave you with this. Um, throughout Scripture, our Trinitarian God is revealed and really the hope of our redemption hinges on each of their specific roles. And we draw our understanding of the Trinity from the totality of Scripture. In case anyone doesn't know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And it's used a lot of times to, to, to be combative to Christianity. But we, we, we get understanding from all of Scripture and so when we start to unpack what Scripture is saying about God, there are three summary statements that are undeniable throughout Scripture. And once we have these three summary statements, we, we come to a conclusion about what we understand of the Trinity. So these three summary statements are, number one, God is three persons. We see throughout Scripture... Um, the Father, the Word, the Son, and the Holy Spirit specifically identified as God. It's there. We cannot deny that. So that's the first statement. God is three persons. Number two, 
Each person is fully God. They're equal in the sense that they're all truly God. And number three, there is one God. We cannot deny any of these with Scripture. Scripture fully affirms all three of these statements. So from that, we back up and go, okay, then what does that mean? We have our doctrine of the Trinity. So, while our heads are still spinning from that for a while, um, I want us to hone in on the third point, because this gets right at, obviously the, the whole Trinity does, but the third point gets at the point we're going down today. So Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is one of the, the, the preeminent verses on the uh, singularity of God, us having one God. And while in the context of polytheist, this would have been saying, we only have one God, we don't have many gods. But look at the way it's worded, because it's also saying something slightly different. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's not just saying there's only one God, it's saying God is one, He is whole, He is complete. There's no division, there's no separation, there's no discord. There's no jealousy, there's no strife. God is one. There is only love, harmony, and unity. This is what it means for God to be one. Our Trinitarian God is whole. Harmony, unity. These are the words that we that define what we know of how our Trinitarian God functions. This matters in our passage. Because Jesus' prayers must be in unison with the Trinitarian purpose, plan, and execution. Before you drift off thinking this is simply some pointless jump from a high dive, let's, this, I want us to ask ourselves some questions about Jesus' intercession. How do we find any confidence in His intercession without these realities? When Hebrews tells us that he always lives to make intercession for us, is that simply Jesus throwing up hopes and wishes? Is Jesus truly God and truly man? Is he effectively laying hands on us both as the arbiter, or is he just trying? See, the unity and the harmony of our Trinitarian God is no light thing. A lot weighs in the balance. Jesus isn't merely begging God. No, He is God. And He is fulfilling His role for our redemption. So, He concludes His prayer, let's get into this last section, with some words that are very helpful and hopeful for us. Because up to this point, He's been praying for those in His, in his immediate audience. So let's get in verse 20 to go through the rest of the chapter. He says, I do not ask for these only, these being the ones sitting here with me, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So this, this is what we have, the words of the apostles. So we're the ones he's speaking about now. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So in this section, there are two primary things that I want us to, to look at and see for us. <clears throat> Jesus wasn't just praying for those present, but also for those who would believe through the words of the apostles. 
And in verse 21, he prays for our unity. And thinking about back to what we just talked about with the Trinity, notice how he grounds our unity in the unity of the Trinity. Now, he only mentions himself and, and the Father. But that's what he's getting at, is the mutual unity of Christ, in, or in the Trinity in verse 21. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. So without a unity of the Trinity, then what hope do we have for unity? In verse 24, he says, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. Jesus is praying that we will be with him in glory. I want us to think at this moment back to the, the absolute statements he made about the disciples that we know were not absolutely fulfilled in their lives at the point. And as he's praying for us to be with him in glory, he's praying for something that's absolute, even though we don't see that completely in our lives now. So from delivering the words, this is even how he begins the chapter. Father, I've made your name manifest to them. I've given them your words. So from that, all the way to bringing his children to glory, Christ is active in the work of salvation for his children. He's active in the whole process. And his actions include interceding for us. Think back to Luke uh, 22. So Jesus addresses Peter and says, Peter, um, Satan's demanded to have you and sift you like wheat. Sounds similar to Job? Interesting. And Jesus says, but I have prayed that your faith will not fail. And although Peter denied Christ, ultimately his faith did not fail. fail. So we all go through Numerous things in life. Things that make us question the foundation of our faith, make us question Christ, make us question all reality. And when we're struggling to see how God is working, we can trust Jesus is interceding for his children. Jesus didn't have to tell Peter he was praying for him. And the outcome would have been the same. Because Jesus was doing it. Jesus told Peter, and what, what do you think that did for Peter's encouragement later? Not, not to just be reconciled, but to go, I realize Christ was praying for me. And then even alone later when he writes epistles and speaks of Jesus' intercession. Also, it's for us. We can see Jesus say that to Peter, and then we get to see the end of the end of Peter's story, right? And go, wow, this we because we 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 have other passages in Scripture, Romans eight, Hebrews that talk about they say Jesus is interceding for us, but we don't really know what that looks like without John seventeen. That's what's so amazing about it. We get to sit back and go, this is actually Him doing it. We get a picture of what it means for Jesus to intercede for us. We can trust the same Christ that brought the words of the Father will bring us to the Father through His intercession. Also, there are plenty of instructions in Scripture, right? Scripture regularly presses us to submit, to repent, to obey, to do good works. There are plenty of things it tells us to do. And when we recognize that we are doing those things that we're walking in harmony with God's word, we should be reminded of Christ's intercession. Thinking on Christ's intercession reminds us that we can't manufacture godly desires on our own. And it points us to his love and his power because Christ's powerful intercession changes our desires and then empowers us to obey. So whether, whether life is troublesome and, and, and just distraught, we, we trust Christ to intercede for us on our behalf for our protection as he's 
talked about with the disciples to keep us in the faith when everything's going haywire. And when everything's going great, we're reminded of His intercession as the cause. His intercession is active and powerful. He truly is the arbiter between. He's, he truly is, like when we said earlier, Jesus remedied the problem. It sounds all well and good as some little sentence, but when you unpack this, you start to see like He truly is bridging the chasm of holiness, laying hands on a divine, holy God who cannot be in the presence of sin, and working in the humans to bring about what needs to be done to be in the presence of that God. Our salvation rests on Christ's mediation. Overall, His mediation is work on our behalf. And certainly the cross is the focal point. This was, I had to try to write these sentences very carefully. Because I, I think sometimes there are things that may get neglected in our own thoughts or understanding and, and we miss out on a huge reality and a huge benefit. But I don't want to downplay anything else. The cross is certainly the focal point of Christ's mediatorial work for us. Sometimes because the crucifixion is in the past, I think we can think about what He's done and neglect the reality of what He is doing. Christ is interceding for His people, for His children. As a child of God, if you're sitting here today, as a child of God, the, the um, absolute statements that Jesus made for His disciples are absolute statements He's making of us, and they're because of His intercession for us. So my hope and my prayer today is that our minds are engaged to understanding this and that our hearts are enraptured by Christ's ongoing work for us. Let's look in the past. Let's revel in the work of the cross and the resurrection, Christ's holy, righteous life. Yes. And let's look in the present and let's be amazed by Christ's work for us now, today, tomorrow, Till he brings us to glory. This will lead to greater trust in Christ and certainly greater worship of God. Let's pray.